For those who do not know me, my name is uh, Duchess Inga Inras Liga or D uh, Duchess Inga the Unfettered. I currently reside in Avakal. I used to live in Ontier, um, but if anybody knows about interkingdom history, uh, I didn't move at all, just the borders did. Anyway, so I currently reside in, in Avakal. Uh, I am speaking today about the high tubu pants because of a very specific set of questions I've always been asked. I make these lovely poofy pants and people are always asking me, how do you make them? Because the pattern that's commonly found online is a little fussy. So before we actually dive into uh, my class, I want to give you a couple of sort of uh, riders on this content. First of all, I am not a costuming laurel. Uh, I'm a laurel of, of uh, scribal arts, uh, to be precise. I am an, a very devout Viking everything enthusiast, but I'm not, in fact, uh, a, a laurel in this. Um, also, this in, is not intended to be a uh, a research heavy presentation. What I want to do is show you how to make some really awesome pants and show you the history that is behind that. Uh, so just to, to give you some sort of framework for the presentation today. So in order to dive in, I'm going to share with you my presentation and we'll start. Okay, excellent. Uh, Disa, can you confirm that you can see my presentation? Yes, I can. Lovely. Thank you very much, Disa. Excellent. So uh, let's get started. So much ado about high tabu, making Viking pants based on the high tabu find. Uh, for those who are unaware, uh, high tabu is in modern name, uh, naming uh, called Hedeby, um, and it's currently located in Schleswig Holstein in Germany, but it was at this point in time uh, of history was part of uh, Denmark or the, the Viking lands as opposed to um, held in, in, in any other uh, you know, it wasn't part of Germany at that point in time. It's really just right across the border. Now, uh, the other thing I want to mention as I go through is that unless otherwise noted, the photos are in fact mine. I've had the great pleasure of traveling all through Scandinavia and taking pictures of a bunch of these very cool things, including the high tube pants. So, what are we going to do today? Today we are going to uh, talk about the evidence for poofy pants in the Viking Age. I'm going to show you some pictorial and some literary evidence that suggests that they did in fact wear giant voluminous crazy pants. Uh, we're going to talk about the actual fragments that this is based upon because there are actual had to be pants that this are, these are based upon. We're going to talk about the pattern that I've sourced specifically for the version that I make and then other pants uh, designs that are found uh, in Scandinavia before and during the Viking Age that inform that design. I'm going to talk about how to scale it to fit, and I'm going to then actually show you how I assemble the pants, not in real time, because of course, watch me make a pair of pants would be pretty boring, but I've got some lovely little cutouts to show you the order of assembly, because I find most people, uh, they have no difficulty finding the pattern, it's actually figuring out how to turn it into a pair of pants that becomes the challenge. I'm going to talk through some of my uh, sort of recommendations in terms of order of assembly, uh, the way to finish it, basically all the elements that I think help them turn out well, and then also some unique adaptations that are in fact my own related to these pants that are based on actual living history applications, by, and by that I mean my husband wears them. So let's get started. So what do we know about poofy pants? Um, there are lots of excellent pictorial images uh, found in stone, carved stones, as well as figurines. Um, you can see if you look at the figurine from Upatra, I can never say that right, the, the actual figurine as opposed to the stone. Um, he's got very, very fancy uh, poofy pants. Probably for anyone who does Viking reenactment or, or Viking in the SCA, uh, they're probably pretty fam familiar with these kind of big, loop, big loopy, uh, giant volumes of fabric pants. Um, on both of the rune stones, you can see again, uh, the bro is particular, you can see uh, definitely a very poofy and clearly not going down to the ankle, but rather to the knee. And that's kind of important. They're not a big full pant that goes to the ankle, uh, but to the knee length. And then the uh, tomb slab from Gotland uh, is, uh, shows a little bit more of a straight line. Um, hard to say whether or not that designates a different type of pant, but again, interesting, you know, interesting because it shows them ending at the, the knee length and definitely showing a pleating. In terms of other sources, the Osberg tapestry uh, from, that's found in Norway shows a bunch of fellows clearly wearing very, very wide pants that go from a narrow waist to a very wide profile at the bottom. Now, I've just given you a few samples. There are 
oodles of, of examples of this sort of profile found on runestones in particular, but also on other sources. But I just want to give you a bit of an idea that uh, the big crazy pants you sometimes see the Viking fellows wear, do actually have that profile, that, that, uh, that silhouette, has a basis in history. Some of the other things that we know uh, in terms of literary cues, now I recognize that both of these are sort of writings of writings of writings uh, and everybody who studies Viking Age culture knows that um, uh, Ibn is a little bit fussy but, uh, and problematic, but I do think it's very interesting that both of them reference a giant volume of fabric and then the idea of them being rolled to the knee. Um, and this is really, really kind of a fundamental element of the pants. These are not fabric conservative pants. These are not the sort of thing that, um, with you know, someone who was uh, you know a thrall or or a, a poor member of, of society would have necessarily had a pair. These involve a lot of fabric, and they are clearly meant to be an ostentatious display of wealth through the volume of fabric in their pants. So, any questions as I move along? Okay, I'll give Disa a moment. Okay, so here are the actual Haithabu pants fragments. So um, for people unfamiliar with the dig, the Harder, Harbor at Hedeby, uh has been a great resource for finding uh, just a host of everyday items uh, of all sorts. Uh, this photo is my own from the museum demonstrating the pants fragment. I actually have, have gotten to see it in person. Unfortunately, it's no longer in display, a display in the museum. Um, I'm not sure why, but their uh, fabric displays, their fabric finds are no longer on display. Uh, so this is, I'm really glad I have a picture of it because it's now gone away. At any rate, these are not garment pieces though that were found in funeral finds or um, in homes or what have you, these were found as uh, caulking in uh, boats. So they were wrapped up as caulking, used as rags in, in boats later. And so uh, we know that they date between the 8th and 10th century, and there's been a lot of garments found in this way, uh, but I just want to differentiate between this and say the Burqa finds which are from uh, graves. The translation from the text I've, I've noted here is a pair of baggy pant trousers with very fine crepe weave. Um, the pleats are, were already planned in the spinning process by giving the yarn an extremely tight twist. The finished fabric was rinsed in hot water and shrank considerably, therefore creating the crepe pleats. Now this is an important deviation from, uh, or rather marks an important deviation in the recreation I do because we're quite sure that this was actually tension woven uh, wool that was designed to create pleats as soon as it would come off the loom, it would form its pleats by itself. Uh, I am not a weaver. I do not weave. I certainly, even if I was a weaver, I don't know that I have the capacity to make something of this. Uh, that, this is a very um, uh, complicated type of, of, of weaving project. And so um, what we do instead, or what I do instead, is I take um, yardage, linen or wool, and I manually pleat it. So I just want to make sure we're really clear. The extant find is not in fact manually pleated. It's, it's pleated by virtue of the nature of the weaving the fabric. Um, I don't do that. Uh, however, the effect, which is a very densely pleated garment, um, is still maintained. And so what I'm looking for is more of a evoking that silhouette as opposed to necessarily following the exact process that the pre people who made these pants uh, would have used. Uh, in terms of other finds found in the harbor, uh, all of these red marked uh, garments plus the narrow pants, there's extant pieces that have been found in uh, the harbor finds. They actually found a lot of clothing there. It's really quite interesting. The ladies' clothing is really interesting as well, but that's a different discussion. Uh, the, the finds, as you can see in the very first image, are intended to, uh, or presumed to be that very poofy pants that goes, uh, you know, very, very narrow at the waist and then very full over the knee. So um, this is what we think those fragments are telling us based on the nature of the fabric that's there. Um, I have not done this uh, analysis. This is based on people who are professionals in this field. I'm just sharing with you the resources I've used to sort of uh, base, base my reproduction. So the pattern that is plausible. Now, anybody who's looked for the poofy pants has probably run into the historical Val Valdar pattern um, online. It's not in English. Uh, so some people then, you know, that's a bit of an extra challenge. It also has limited measurements. This is a really challenging pattern to uh, convert into something usual, usual um, which is why I'm sharing with you today, because what I find is people say they find this and then they don't know where to go from here. 
So I'm going to show you how I do that. Okay. Um, yes, Deza? Uh, so does that mean that the cuff of, on the end of the leg is modern? Um, the cuff on the end of the leg is modern. Yes. It's a, it's a, um, we don't have enough of the pants to presume that. Um, so that is, that is a, uh, that's an adaptation. However, based on uh, the sort of um, hooks or latches that have been found, you know, the, the garter hooks, uh, there's some theories out there that they were actually attached to the pants and they would just sort of latch on that way. Uh, the, in order to retain the pleating, though, I do pleat it into either a, a knee cuff or a leg cuff, and I'll show you the difference between the two. Uh, some, somebody else mentioned, um, they wonder if you could recreate the effect by uh, taking a very finely woven wool and shrinking it and filling it. That's entirely possible. I think, um, again, that's, that, is, that is a little outside of my skill set. I've seen other people do this where they, they actually take the wool and, 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 uh, and expose it to steam or, or hot water to, to get it to retain those pleats. Um, the challenge with that is you do result, with a, with, result in a garment that tends to be really, really dense. And, um, you know, I, I think most times we're looking for, especially as reenactors, we're looking for pants that are a little bit less hot than uh, what you'd get as a result of that. Uh, but I think that's absolutely valid and I would hardly encourage you to, to give it a try. So does that answer the question? Okay. Uh, so the reason why I chose this pattern is two things. First of all, uh, having traveled uh, throughout a lot of the museums in, in uh, Scandinavia, I've been, to, uh, I've been to Sweden, Germany, Denmark, uh, and Iceland. And of course, uh, you've seen most of the museum finds. The only place I haven't been, I've been to Finland as well, my apologies. And I've been to Norway, but not to the part where they have a lot of the clothing finds. So I've just really been all over Scandinavia. Uh, but when we see the clothing reproductions done in the museums, a lot of them use this pattern. And I, I, that doesn't actually mean it's right, um, but it's one that, that when they're doing, when they're dressing the displays, they seem to use this, this style of pattern. So it intrigued me from that perspective. Also, a lot of reenactors that I know in Europe tend to wear this sort of pant. Again, that doesn't necessarily mean it's accurate, but it made it interesting to me. Uh, the other thing, though, is that I feel like it fits the fragments reasonably. Um, and it's consistent with other pants finds. So, and I'll, I'll get into that in just a moment. But, you know, the, the way that they have approached this pattern is uh, you know, actually is surprisingly fabric conservative once you accept the fact you're making giant pants. Um, the, uh, the, the design though, the way the crotch and the, and the butt is done um, really fits with some of the other, the other pants finds from, from Scandinavia. So here are some other pant patterns that I feel likely informed the design. Um, really, really quick, if this is okay. Yeah. Um, somebody asked, cotton pants versus linen and wool. One of your sources mentioned cotton, which I didn't think was used as much in Scandinavia at the time. No, and I think that's a translation thing. Uh, Ibn is problematic for a bunch of reasons, um, not the least of which being that we, we know that they didn't wear cotton. Um, but cotton would be a fabric that he would have understood. And I think if someone wasn't necessarily... Um, uh, you know, versed in fiber arts, he might mistake a lightweight linen for a lightweight cotton, and that would be, I think, equivalent, if that makes sense. Um, so his saying that it's cotton, I think, is a, I use his, his reference point more as a suggestion of the volume of the pants, as opposed to the, the fabric makeup. Um, the accent ones are, are wool. We know that they made a lot of garments out of linen. I think reasonably these both would be, could be made, and I certainly I do make them out of linen or wool. Does that answer your question? This is, yeah, thank you. It makes a lot more sense. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, sorry, I should have explained that a little bit better. He's mentioning the cotton is really problematic. I sincerely doubt that he would have readily known the difference. So, um, okay, so I'm just bringing up, there's lots of pants that you can look at that are, that are pre-Viking and uh, especially, there's very little actually during the Viking age, but uh, pre-Viking pants that we can look at for construction. Um, what's interesting about the Thorsberg is while they are well before the, had to be the high taboo pants, um, they are from the exact same region, which is the Schleswig Holstein. So I find that kind of interesting. And if you look at the way the pattern is designed in the second image, it does very much the exact same thing, which is a square seat, a, uh, a long strip that represents the crotch, a waistband, and then a leg that is designed not as a tube, but rather that wraps around and connects to the seat of the pants. So to me, that's a, that's a really interesting connection to the design that's, that's um, in the, um, in the pattern that I'm, I'm using. So I feel like it adds a little bit of, 
at least plausibility. Again, like I said, this is not exhaustively researched. I'm just looking for something that is a, a plausible pant. Given the limitations of the finds in the Viking Age when it comes to clothing, I mean, honestly, most of what we're doing is guessing. So uh, think of this as a moderately informed um, guess. Uh, I include the Skuldenham pants because they're also interesting to me, and they do actually date from the same time period as the high taboo pants, or just slightly after, um, albeit they are from Norway. But again, they're they're believed to have that similar sort of square seat, and then the uh, the crotch that comes uh, from the bottom through to the front and attaching to the waistband and the legs attach on. So a little bit of a slightly different construction. These both are designed to be a narrow leg. Obviously, the Hattabu, high taboo pants are designed to be um, as I said, giant and poofy. Any questions about the patterns that I was looking at? So here is my translation of it. First of all, I've included on the screen um, my translation of the actual uh, pattern from Historica Valder, uh, because of course it's not in English. And then what I've done is I've redrawn for you the actual resulting measurements because they don't really give measurements. They say at scale one to one or one to one to 10 rather, and they give you how the pieces sort of fit together, but they don't really give you much else beyond that. So what I've done is I've gone through and based on the scale, um, made adjustments and then actually use this as a functional pattern to see how it works. So um, you can see I've drafted out all the different pieces. I've included the calf. And so the reason why I mentioned that is because from a practical standpoint, a lot of, um, a lot of reconstruct, re reconstructions of this in, intend or include rather a tube that goes right to the ankle. Uh, from you know, wearing it in cold climate or wet climate, that's pretty handy. I don't have any evidence that that's what they did. I really don't. It is, however, a very practical solution, and I'll show you them being worn to give you an idea of what uh, that means. Um, the so the little uh, square piece, or you know, roughly square piece on the side is the bottom, is the is the butt, and then the long stra strip is the crotch. You'll see I've noted a point A on the. Uh, odd shaped, uh, which is obviously the leg, and then the crotch, that's where they connect. And I'll show you in a moment how that all fits together. Um, somebody asked, uh, do you think that that's plausible, the, the you know, knee to ankle um, due to practicality? Well, you know, what I do find is that, um, and so I just have my husband say so from this and other reenactors we know, but having that linen tube down to the ankle is really comfortable from the standpoint of if you put leg wraps on top of that um, or, you know, the cross garters or what have you, it makes a really nice, um, a very comfortable fit that it make, allows the cross garters or the leg, uh, the wickle bonder to stay in place very nicely. Uh, you know, it works really well. And, you know, given that they have narrow legged pants, you know, to me, it's not a big uh, leap to, to say that that's possible, but I, I'm just a guess, really, honestly. Um, but like I said, the profile of the bottom of the calf mirrors the bottom of the Skoldenham pants, right? So it's not as though this is a, you know, a completely foreign uh, profile, if that makes sense. Um, and the thing that I do like about this design is it matches that concept that you see in the Thorsberg, where the leg actually attaches to the butt. So there's not a single seam in the crotch like there is in modern pants, but rather we have a seat and a, and a defined crotch strip and the legs wrap around that. And that, uh, what it results in is pants that very, very rarely actually, um, split the crotch. My husband is not careful with his garb. He's, we camp and do vacation every summer where we spend, uh, you know, a full week pretending to be Vikings and doing things like building a pit house, which is, I think, very cool. Um, and he works in these pants. So uh, the fact that these are comfortable to do things like, you know, uh, climb up in the rafters and uh, hammer up boards or, um, you know, let, sit on the ground and, and do uh, rope craft, you know, they're, they're, very practical pants, aside from just being fantastically ostentatious. So, uh, um, somebody mentioned uh, that they they they're wondering if the uh, if that if that tube down to the ankle would draw water if they were on a boat. Um, 
And then they said Viking board shorts. <laughs> 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 well, so I, and what I'll show in just a moment is how my husband wears them when he doesn't want to worry about them getting wet. Because part of the thing I, you'll notice at the bottom of the, the calf, I put calf widest point. What I do is the tube is not made narrow right to the ankle. It's made to be like a loose, like a pajama pant almost. And what he does is he rolls them up to the knee and then puts his garter over top of that so that if it is wet and he doesn't want them to get damp, you know, if it's a very dewy day or what have you, he can roll them up as well. And uh, I actually no longer make his just with the option to um, cuff because the long cuff can work as both. And then he has pants that do double duty. Does that make sense? That makes sense to me. <laughs> lovely, excellent. Okay, so on to the next slide. So I'm gonna show you the pants on my lovely husband. So you can see they are very poofy. Um, what I really like about this, the backside of you, aside from the fact that he has a really great backside, is that it very much matches that really voluminous poof down to the knee that you see in the runestone images. So to me, if we're looking at how do you, how are you emulate, emulating that, um, that profile, that silhouette, to me, this really, really nails that. Uh, that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the moving parts of the pattern, which I'm going to show you in just a moment, but it, I, I feel like the overall silhouette is really effective. So what I'm gonna do before we start looking at all the other, actually what I'll do is I'll show you the pictures really quick and then, then I'll show you the pattern. So here is the way the seat works. Um, I do the seat in two different ways. If it's really light fabric and he likes it really full, I will pleat it into the waistband. For denser fabric, um, I don't pleat the seat component because it, it can get kind of bulky. Uh, so for the wool, then it would be um, smooth just in that one square part. And then this is showing it tie and close. And I'm gonna talk about this because this is a departure from the pattern uh, that I'm really happy with. Uh, this is very practical, but it is not part of the pattern. This is my own uh, cleverness. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to switch my camera and uh, what I'm going to do is show you how to actually do the assembly. So hopefully this works. Okay, so hopefully you can all see my lovely hands here. So what I have cut out in paper, construction paper, is two giant chunks that represent the pants. So I've got one leg, uh, the crotch area, oh, let me try that again, the crotch area, the leg area, two pieces. Then what I have is the, the actual crotch strip. I have the seat. And then I, I have the leg the waistband and the cuff. So here are all the possible pieces that I could show you. So this is the part that everybody gets really confused about. How do I actually make these be pants? So the key component, oh, let me flip this. I've actually lost my little dots. You can see I have got little dots on the legs and on the crotch and on the seat. How this works in assembly is you actually start with the crotch. So what you will do is join this length to one leg, and that then will give you a crotch. You will then join the other leg to the length of the crotch. It's gonna seem very strange. You will then take that piece and you are going to sew the seat in. Now that's gonna seem really, really strange, but it works, trust me. And then what you'll have is you'll have these two legs that will be joined by their little crotch component, and you will then join up that leg. It will come up the side to itself and ultimately attach to, up to the seat, to the waistband. I hope that makes sense. This is a tricky thing to show without actually sewing pants. So any questions? I can show on the actual pants if people would like to see as well. So when we are looking at, this is the seat here. And I will mark this with pins to make it a little easier. These are the corners of the seat. Can everybody see that? And you can see the leg, the crotch, and the leg. 
Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, perfect. So what you end up with then is a leg that from the cuff is come straight up one leg and you're joining into the seat. So from the waistband, it goes down the seat and into the remainder of the leg that you have created by joining this crotch. Okay, any questions about that? I'm not seeing any yet, I'll let you know. Okay, perfect. So just one last time then for anybody that might have missed it. What did I lose my, I lost my crotch. <laughs> Where's my little teeny piece of paper that's my crotch? Oh, goodness. Um, okay, that does make it a little trickier. Oh, there it is, perfect. So again, you're going to have one leg. You are going to sew the crotch piece all the way up and along the crotch, the, the not the leg, but the crotch part of this leg piece. Then you are going to add in the other piece. And what that does is that then creates the front of the pants. So this is your front of your pants. And then you add the bottom. And in order to actually turn it into complete pants, actually, maybe I can draw a little knot. You are going to add, you're going to join this point to this point. And so all the way down. Does that make sense? It's, it's, a, it's a fussy thing. Now, the important thing about this is the order of things. If you try to do it in different orders, if you try to attach anything sooner, these pieces don't join happily. The whole point of doing this where they are joined as one piece that is, of course, more complicated than the paper is that then you have a very clean join of the bottom with the crotch and the legs. Can you show it one more time? Absolutely. Okay, so we have leg one. This is our joining point. There's a little dot. That is the spot marked A on the pattern I've given you. We're going to add in the crotch piece at the spot marked A. We're going to sew that little guy all the way up the inside of the crotch. We are going to then join the other leg at that point marked A and sew it up the crotch as well. Then this will, you will then have a complete piece. The, the math on this, you're going to want to add in seam allowance, obviously, to make this work. But the math then is that these three pieces combined join with the seat of the pants. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, somebody asked, how do you decide the measurement of the curves of the leg? So this is, I won't, I won't lie to you, this is the tricky part. If you look at the pattern that I've given you, uh, let me see if I've got it handy here. Um, I've given you the, my rough measurements. You can see I've included, you know, this height should be 11, 11.75. 11, uh, this height should be 13. Um, all of these measurements in terms of the shape are based off of the, uh, off of the uh, pattern from uh, the Historica of Aldar site. The design that I've done in terms of the length of the leg, um, so this is one of those things where this is made based off of, uh, honestly, a, a modern concern, which is at 29 inches, I can buy a 60 width linen and I split it in half and now I have two legs. That really allows the linen to go a long way. The other thing is on most uh, adults, that length, the 29 inches, gives a very nice full sort of drape uh, from the waist down to the uh, knee. If you're concerned about the length, what I recommend you do is just take a measuring tape, place it at the, the waistline to sort of approximate this height, and then just let it hang and put that, that uh, 29 inch mark um, just uh, below the knee to see that it's adequately full. This is where you do need to make adjustments if you're making it for children, because obviously it needs to be scaled. Uh, children's clothing always is a little bit trickier. 
Um, what I generally make this out of is three meters of fabric, which allows me to have three meters in each leg, which is beautifully voluminous. Um, and then your extra pieces can be cut out of these voids um, or if, you know, out of, um, and, you know, just a little bit at the end. So maybe just slightly less than three meters. This design though allows for actually very little wastage, especially if you piece uh, the, the tubes because you have a fair bit of, of material get, that gets cut away in these, these uh, spots, if that makes sense. Does that answer? Could you, um, could you show one more time where the, where the pant legs get sewn together? Absolutely. So where they get sewn together is, so if we have this, this is where paper is a really tricky thing. If we've added in that, that lovely um, crotch and we now have our other leg right here, oh, uh, other way around, my apologies. The other leg right here, we have then the leg will come around and sew to itself up this point up that, that curve here, let me try that again. So it will sew up that curve and then connect to the, the uh, I'm sorry, this way up to the leg. So then ultimately this part will connect at the waistband, and this part will connect at the cuff. Does that make sense? Let me try and lay that out in a way that's a little easier to see. If we have it this way, then that means this, these two points connect. So the bottom of the leg on one end and the bottom of the leg on the straight end match up. And then this point where I put a little diamond or a triangle rather, and this point back here will join. So this line connects here. Yeah, people say that makes sense now. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry, it's a fussy thing. And like I said, it, it's easier if I can actually show you as I sew, uh, but that makes this class several hours. And I think people um, uh, people have other things to do than hear me talk about pants. So um, one of the things I do want to mention in terms of finishing, I do recommend if you're going to do uh, French seams or finished edges that you finish as you go. So that means you'll want to finish this joining completely before you, you, you unite it to this seam at which point you'll finish this and then the two leg seams and then add in the waistband. Does that make sense? Um, somebody asked what the horizontal distance A to C. Horizontal distance A to C. Uh, that curve. Um, so the, the height, let me put this back so you can see it the right way around. I've noted the height. Honestly, my best recommendation to you, if you can, is take the pattern I've given you that is available for, from the course, where, that is directly from the Historica uh, Valdar site, and just take it, photocopy it, and blow it up. Oh, is the, am I upside down? Am I, is that correct now? Now you're right side up, yeah. Oh, yeah. no, I'm oh, sorry about that. <laughs> My apologies. Um, that makes way more sense. Uh, so what I really, uh, the easiest way to get this curve correct, frankly, is to take it to Staples and blow it up until this measure matches 3.75, because that's your one sort of fixed unit. Uh, that's my best recommendation, because redrawing this, there are two very different sort of curves. Um, and as bewildering as this looks, it actually works beautifully. So, uh, so let me, I need to then switch this properly. Okay, there we go. So then I've given you the height to sort of give you a rough approximation of what your expanded pattern should be, uh, but figuring out the math on these curves is tricky. And uh, I, I just blow up the, the pattern to make it, to adapt that shape. So the, the other question I have is, so the measurement you have on your pattern should be relatively uh, one size fits all for adults with minor tweaking? Correct. Um, the big difference that I make is the waistband and the size of the calf. Most adult uh, humans will fit this. Um, if they're littler people, narrower through the waist, they'll just have poofier pants. Um, if they are, uh, I would say over, mm, I would say if they're over like say 100 and, or uh, 225 to 230 pounds, you may want to make it a little longer if they want really, really splendidly full pants. Um, but honestly, the uh, the, um, uh, the, the more fabric you put in, the bigger they are going to be, the more fabulous they're going to be. So that, that is, uh, that's really the only determining factor. Um, so the things that you're going to measure that are going to be particular to your, your wearer are going to be your waistline, 
Uh, so obviously uh, that needs to be as big around as their waist. And then I add uh, 10 to 12 inches for overlap, and I'll explain that in a second. The calf will be variable uh, because you want to measure the length from above the knee to ankle, and then you want the calf at widest point or for the option two calf at widest point. Otherwise, it is a relatively one size fits all. And I have fit this on people of varying, greatly varying sizes. Uh, if you want to stick to the being able to use half of 60 inches to make your uh, pants and you have someone who's a bit longer through the leg, you can just make the waistband deeper. And I've actually done this and had some great comments about how the deeper waist uh, for maybe the more full figure gentleman gives them a little bit of. Um, uh, you know, a smoother profile. So a little, little bit of a Captain Kirk maneuver, if that makes any sense. Um, so hope that that is really one of the big adjustments you can make if you don't want to have to buy yardage um, that is unique to each leg. Like I said, this is beautiful because you can split a, 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 a 60 inch wide linen quite beautifully down the, down the center and you get two legs out of it, which allows you to get, you know, three, almost three full meters of full leg out of three full meters of fabric. Any other questions about the pattern assembly? The grain direction. Um, I lay uh, the grain, because I'm usually using the meterage in, in uh, the full, the, trying to use the full width, the grain is from top to bottom. Um, uh, and I generally cut the others that same way. Although sometimes with the calf, I fudge it. It doesn't seem to me, uh, doesn't seem to be that, um, that big of a deal if there's a little bit of a twist to it. Uh, I see somebody's asking to see the back seam on the yellow pants again. Let me clear my space a smidge. Make sure I don't lose all my moving parts and show the back seam again. So on the yellow pants, here is the butt component. Let me lay this out smoothly. I'm going to mark the corners so you can maybe see it a bit better. So those are the corners of that, of this piece. So that's what you're looking at right here. Okay. Then what you're seeing here is where the crotch joins in and where those two pieces from that leg are connected. So this is this is that piece right here. Does that make sense? Any other questions about the yellow pants? The stocking seam. Um, not sure I understand what you're asking there, Magda. What do you mean? I think the bottom of the pants. Oh, up the leg. Absolutely, thank you. So starting from the cuff, we have the seam, can you see that? Is that okay, Disa? I'm trying to make sure I'm in there. I can see it, yeah, okay. I can see it. So uh, it extends up the back of, then. so this line from waist to cuff is this, okay? And as it comes up, it then joins with the other piece of the leg that has come around. So what we're seeing here in the seam, it comes up from the cuff. It actually joins with the other part of the leg. So what we have right here is an intersection of the leg component, the butt, and the other side of the leg. Does that make sense? I'll show you the inside too, because this shows the order of construction. Also, I get to show off my nice seams. Um, so you can see here that the three pieces were joined in a single piece that was then united with the uh, with the, the bottom. Does that make sense? Yes, I said yes, thank you. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so, so that is how you, uh, I'm gonna switch now back to me, just a moment here. Hello, everyone. Okay, so um, then what you've got now is all of those moving parts in terms of the order assembly. And that's the part that I found 
uh, through trial and error to be really quite, oh, I need to move back a little bit here. There we go. Um, that's the part that I found through trial and error to be really tricky because it's such a um, counterintuitive way to assemble things. But when it comes together, it's, it's actually really splendid. Now, what you'll have when you join all these parts now is two absolutely gigantic legs. It's going to look like the largest pair of board shirts you've ever seen. And what you need to do is now pleat those volumes into a waistband. Um, if you're not used to doing pleating of this kind of volume, it can be really cumbersome. So I have a trick that I want to share with you that will help make it a lot easier. So what I do is I call it doing it by halves. So what that means is that you're going to have your set waistband, and I'll, I'll show you my set waistband, and you're going to have your great big huge long chunk of fabric that goes on forever that you need to fit into it. So what I do and I guess actually I'll hold this up to the camera so that makes it easier, is what I do is I fold my waistband in half and then half and then half, resulting in all these little marks that show um, sections of the pant. And so if I folded this now twice, so I've got three marks, I would take the length of my fabric and do the exact same thing and fold it into three chunks, okay? And then I would point, pin rather, those pleated points. Maybe I'll switch to my other camera for this. Okay. Then what I will do is I will pin those, those little folded points, and this is lovely on linen, into the waistband. Thereby sort of breaking the volume of the pants into manageable chunks. That makes sense. Can everybody see that? So what you have is then the volume is now, oh, there I go. Uh, the volume is now divided into sections onto that narrow waistband. And then I just repeat that. So I find the halfway point in the, the volume component, the fullness of the leg, and I find the halfway point in the waistband and just continue that. And then once you've got it to a smaller chunk, you're just going to do little tiny finger pleats. The beautiful thing is that because this is uh, just so full of pleats, you, it doesn't have to be precise. It's not like when you're making, um, you know, skirting in a late period gown where if the pleats aren't even, it's really going to show. You've got so many little tiny pleats here and I'll, I'll, you can see how tiny the pleats are, um, that it doesn't really matter. And so it, it, it's kind of nice. You don't have to necessarily be too, too fussy. I do pin, pin each pleat as I, as I stitch it. And I, I'll be honest, I machine stitch this down to trap the pleats before I go and do the rest of the assembly um, because this is, this is fussy. So does that uh, joining it by halves make sense? I use makes, yes, people are saying yes, it absolutely but, makes sense. It, it, uh, I used to try and actually measure it, um, like I would do with, you know, if I was making, you know, uh, late German or something like that, and it, and it, and I, it absolutely drove me to, to madness. And so this technique allows you to fit that giant volume, because you're fitting, uh, you know, three meters or three yards of fabric uh, into, uh, you know, a fairly small strip of, uh, for the waistband, and so it's just really important. Uh, define finger pleating, please. Does the direct and fold matter? Um, you know, technically it doesn't. I mean, we, we, because we're, this is a, an interpretation rather than based on the extant pants because, of course, they were tension pleated, I, I don't think it really matters. However, from a, from a wearability standpoint, I find if you pick a direction, it's really good. So what I usually do is I do away from the center back. So that would mean if I was looking at the pants, actually, I can show you this on my husband's lovely pants, is... I pleat, there's a center point on the back, there we go, a center point on the back of the seat, and I pleat outwards and around the volume so that they lay uh, consistent. Um, I, I arbitrarily just decided to do this in the back. You could do it the opposite and have them pleat towards the front. Uh, but what I do find is picking a direction for each leg allow, is nicer for the wearer. It tends to give a, a little bit of a smoother profile right around the waist. Um, because certainly, you know, as you can see from the pictures when David's wearing them, that you don't want to have this giant bulky uh, chunk of fabric. So does that make sense in terms of how to pleat them? Yes. 
Um, somebody asked, would it be plausible to just draw string the waistband and have the folds go that way? I know it creates more bulk, but is it historically possible? You know, um, given that we know that there's, uh, you know, the loop um, waistbands found on the Thorsberg, um, you know, drawstring pants are entirely a practical solution. Could you do them with drawstring? Absolutely. Um, the thing I find is that if you do it with a drawstring or if you do it where you just run a, um, a thread and then then pull the fabric, it just ends up bulky. And, and because the profile on this is meant to be, um, I mean, ideally you can actually have that waistband, waistband or waistline shown. I mean, this is a level of, to me, where you're looking for that really clean line that you see in the, in the, uh, in the images where it's very narrow at the waist and then goes to that very full pant. So I'm going to switch back to where you can see my face because my gestures don't make any sense without my face. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, what we're looking for is that very clean line and then out for fullness. That and um, everybody I've made them for has said that they really appreciate the finger pleating because it's very smooth and it's not bulky. Again, if you're, you're wearing this much fabric around your waist, having it lay smoothly as opposed to being all bunched up is much nicer. Um, is it necessarily historically based? You know, again, we're finger pleating um, as opposed to it being uh, tension woven. And so it doesn't really have, we, we don't know. And so it's not, uh, it's not the sort of thing where um, I can say that they would or would not have done it. I do know that the finger pleating results in a really smooth profile and that, uh, you know, it looks snazzy. Okay, so are there any other questions at that point? Um, is everybody clear on finger pleating? I had somebody ask and I wasn't, I wasn't sure. So just really quick then, finger pleating is very simple. I just do sort of the, the depth of my, my finger and I just, uh, oh, hang on, I can't, do, I'm gonna switch my other camera again. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Okay, so what I'm doing with the finger pleating is I have it laid flat. I just do a little tiny bit, the, the depth of like my thumb tip. I fold it on itself and then pin it into place and then do the exact same thing where basically I fold it to the other pleat. So I hope that you can see that and then would pin that into place as well. You can see that lays really nice and flat. Okay, any other questions about the pleating? Okay. Excellent. Okay, so then um, once you've got it all pleated, you need to add in the waistband. I, I mean, I think that's a fairly simple assembly process. Um, in terms of uh, the waistband, though, the way that I do the waistband is a departure. And this is one of the things that, uh, let me just move you a little closer here. Um, this is one of the things that, that I have changed in the original design, uh, you know, from, from Historica. The, um, uh, they show it just budding which would be pretty standard sort of pants. What I found though is these are really big pants. They are really, really heavy, especially in wool. I mean, it's a lot of fabric around your waist. And so what I had originally given, been given as feedback when I made them for people is that they were tricky to go to the bathroom in because as soon as you undo, undo the fly, the weight of the, the linen pretty much takes them right to the floor, uh, which especially if you're using a biff is definitively suboptimal. So. I looked at different ways that you could make that work. You know, if you look at, at modern, um, modern flies, you look at uh, men's underwear, that sort of thing. They have a lot of different ways of making that you can do these, these necessary um, biological things without necessarily having to take off all your clothes. So what I came up with was a solution where instead of having the seams of the crotch, but I actually make the waistband a little longer and I have them overlap. So I'm going to show you the photos again from my lovely husband. So, so what you can see here is there are two, two sets of ties. So I've created simple fabric ties. I just use the scraps and it ties at the hips. Now this does two things. Um, uh, one, it actually allows the pants to be a little forgiving if you put on or, put on or lose weight. That's kind of nice. Um, but what it means is the bulk of where you're joining things, where you're tying it shut, isn't right at the center line where your belts buck, belt buckles and what have you would be. So it removes some of the volume to the sides, which is quite comfortable. What it also does, as you can see in the second picture, is when you untie that first tie, you have a lovely, very handy opening that allows you to keep all the volume of the pant nicely snugged up around your waist and still allows you to, and he didn't demonstrate, uh, you're welcome, um, but uh, allows you to then do what's needed without risking your pants. 
Uh, like I said, especially if these are made out of wool, the volume of fabric involved very readily will drag these right to right to your ankles. So uh, this is an adaptation that I've made, um, and this is strictly my interpretation of a practical solution to a problem that kept arising, which is I have fabulous pants that keep landing in whatever sketchy floor the uh, Biff or Outhouse happens to offer. So uh, this is not based on anything and period necessarily. However, it does work very nicely with the design. Um, with the way that the fly comes up, uh, there it always you always end up sort of joining the two legs because the, the fly insert, that little, uh, this little piece here, um, end short of the waistline and you end up just sort of joining the, the uh, leg to the leg at the top. Rather than doing that, I just simply stop and I leave a gap and it works out to be almost the same depth as a, as a modern fly, which is kind of handy. Uh, like I said, that also allows for, um, you know, the very practical you know, wearing and what have you. Um, it also means the pants stay clean, which is kind of nice. But the biggest thing, like I said, is that because I do the overlap over to the hips, it means it's not bulky. It allows them to, you know, the Vikings tend to wear all those fabulous belts and it removes a lot of the volume that sometimes can happen at the, the center front if you have a drawstring waist. I mean, if you've ever done, you know, do drawstring pajama pants, you always end up with sort of that bulk of fabric right at the waistline and right at the front, which is probably the part we least want to have sort of lumpy. And so this sort of tucks the, the volume off to the sides, which is a little bit more forgiving. And then, like I said, because of the design, you can gain and lose weight and they still fit. Um, David has varied, I would say, probably 40 pounds in these same pants um, over the time since he made them and that I made them and uh, they still fit just as comfortable. It just means the, there's more tie in and uh, a little bit of a larger fly or not, depending on, on the wearing. So, so a couple of questions here from people. Shoot. Um, so uh, it ties first on his left, then his right. Correct. That's the first question. Um, and then I think you answered the second one. Does the overlap in the crotch make them bulky in that area? This is definitely where the finger, uh, the, the finger pleating would matter because um, you're already worrying about fullness. If it's lumpy or bulky, then it's not going to lay smooth and it will give you that thickness. If you do the finger pleating, it doesn't, it lays quite smoothly. Now that said, if you know this pattern that I've shown you today, you can also just continue that seam right up to the waistband um, and use loops on the, uh, the waistband like the Thorsberg or a drawstring. Those I've seen reenactors do that uh, and other, other people who've made these um, and it seems to work very nicely. Like I said, this is an adaptation I've made um, out of uh, largely in, in as a result of having to deal with pants that come back looking pretty filthy by the end of the event uh, that have nothing to do with the dirt and everything to do with you no know, run-ins with the Biff. So, um, so that th there's not necessarily like I said, it's not about this is a a a creative solution, but I also think that it's not inconsistent with the the profile and and that's kind of what I'm, I look for. Um, so somebody asked. Uh, this isn't on the pattern is this the adaptation is on the pattern is that correct it is not exactly so the your your pattern the pattern will give you all of these options you can do the drawstring with this where you would continue it right up to the waistline you could do um the um gather pleats and uh into a waistband and then just have it butted and and tied and have the ties in the front or you can extend it. So you'll notice in the pattern on the waistband, I note uh, add 10 to 12 inches over the waist, waistband size if you're going to do the overlap. And that's because that gives you about a, a five or six inch overlap. Uh, if you don't want to do that overlap, then you just wouldn't add that additional fabric to the waistband and the waistband would then just add, uh, would just end. So instead of it being, so I'm gonna show you. So instead of the waistband coming around and overlapping, hang on a second here, like that, instead of it overlapping like that, you would just have it, da, 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 we just have it flat. Does that make sense? Is that, is that visible? That is visible. Um, so the, the other question, um, can you please show us on the pants where the slit is relative to the crotch inset? Absolutely. Sorry, all I'm seeing is the like screen. Can, I'm sorry? Anybody who has questions, can you please just uh, put them in the in the uh, uh, chat? Thank you. Okay. Was there another question then, Disa? Um, let's see. 
Will the left leg laying over the right leg crotch cause turbulence around the thighs? It doesn't appear to know. Um, my, like my husband is quite the clothes horse and he's pretty particular about his clothes. Um, he finds these very comfortable and he loves them and he, he brags about them. So I'm thinking that he's pretty happy. Um, he, he actually has only one rule about me making these for other people is that nobody can have more yardage in, that I, in pants that I make than him. Uh, so he, he has three and a half meters. Everybody else gets variations under that volume. Um, okay, so. Here is the way the front of his pants look. Now he's managed to actually tear them a smidgen, um, but I'll, I'll show you. So the crotch comes from underneath the seat all the way up and like this. So if you were going to make them just butt, that is all you would do. Because um, all you're doing when you're making the longer waistband is increasing the length you're pleating into. If there's no base waistband left without pleating into it. So that if you were making them to fit without over and overlap, so they would be like this. And the ties or whatever closures you use would be in the front. When you do the overlap, you can see he has a lovely tie here. The overlap goes there. The other tie is inside and they just crisscross. Does that make sense? Some people are asking if, uh, if you can minimize the PowerPoint so that they can see you better. Oh, um, they can minimize it. I actually don't know, but you know what? Why don't I just uh, exit the PowerPoint, uh, stop sharing this, this slide, and then you can just see me and I'll show it bigger. So just one moment. Okay. So let me try that again. So coming from the bottom of the butt, we go up the leg all the way to the crotch. Is that better? So we have the crotch. If you were not going to make them with overlap, it would just close like this with the ties. And then you'd have a little spot there that I can peek out of. Um, if you do the overlap, one goes under and ties in front, the other goes behind and ties behind. Is that better? The important thing I wanted to show though is like I said, you don't end up with any waistband strap um, without pleats into it. When you extend the waistband to have that overlap, you're just expending, extending the length that you are pleating into. Um, you always are going to have pleats matching right up to the end of your waistband. If you were to do a drawstring, then this would be opened and you could have a drawstring through. Um, and then in that case, you could have a, a larger waistband slightly to draw and do much as you would do a pajama pants. So the one side is the crotch strip and on uh, and the other side is just the leg, correct? Actually, the crotch strip on the, this design actually ends well before the waistline. So even if you make it so it butts, you can see the crotch line ends. It is not as long as the space to the waist. So you will, if you're making it whole, you will be joining leg to leg. The crotch actually ends prior to that. And that's why it doesn't matter which style you make, the pattern works, because it naturally has a point where the crotch ends and you have just leg that either is joined or lapped. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Excellent. I apologize if this takes a little while to explain. It's a really complicated thing to show remotely. So my apologies if it's a little bit uh, frustrating. So sorry. Um, um, the the one other question that is is here is uh, does he wear his under tunic tucked in then over uh, then over does he wear the under tunic tucked in then over tunic over top? That's a great question. So I'll be honest with you, it sort of depends on um, how he's feeling about his weight. I'll be perfectly honest with you. When he's feeling all slim, he tucks his both tunics into his pants and it gives a very smooth profile so you can see all of the gorge pleating and he wears his belts over top of it. Um, and for, he, for him, he said that's sort of when he's feeling very, very splendid because he can see, you can see how amazing the pants are. 
uh, when he's feeling a little bit more weight conscious, he will either tuck both, or pardon me, tuck the under tunic in and then have the over tunic over or have both over and then just have the pants uh, against his, his, uh, his skin. Or he also has some uh, little Viking unders that, I, that, he, that he wears underneath these, uh, some underwears um, that are basically based off of the Skolden Hama pants. It works really, really nicely. Um, and so uh, he, you could do that layering as well. In that case, then you mostly see the fullness at the, at, um, from sort of the bottom half or, or third of the thigh to the knee. Still looks really incredibly fabulous and actually very nicely matches some of the images you see on the runestones. Uh, sort of, it, it, I, there's, we don't know definitively. It matches the profile found in, in some um, others where it's clearly, you can see more of the pant uh, matches others. So I think it would really depend on the wearer. The nice thing about having the, the, the pant tunic tucked in though, is it really does show off how fabulous the pants are. And if we're looking at this um, as, from a standpoint of a conspicuous wealth, conspicuous display, showing off his amazing saffron linen pants is kind of a, it's a pride thing, right? He feels fabulous. Um, otherwise tucked in, it's nice. Uh, he, he wears like a boxer a boxer short underneath. Someone asked me, uh, what does he wear underneath? He wears like a, a boxer short that is based off of, um, uh, actually off of the, the Skolden Hama because uh, it's actually a 10th century, 11th century garment. But the Thorsberg also is a, you can easily adapt that to, a, to an underwear as well. Um, if it's really, I don't know that he does worry about those. Yes. Do, do the yellow pants have the calf sleeve? Yes. Okay. So let's move on to the calf. Thank you very much for the reminder. So the yellow pants do have the calf sleeve. And so I'm going to just show you really quick some images on the slides and then you'll, then I'll explain the rest. So, um, so you should be able to see these are the slides are coming up now. Okay. Yep. Yes, they are. Okay. So here are the two versions of how he wears them. He wears them with a garter or um, uh, with his wickle bonder over the sleeve, or he rolls it up and then uh, garters it. So this allows him to have the linen tube down and then have the wickle bonder or, or leg wraps over top of that, or his woolly socks. He has some lovely uh, Nalban socks that he wears over top of them. Or in the hotter weather, and he, this is actually really common with uh, Orange Baron in particular, he loves to just wander around in bare feet and with his pants curled up to, uh, coiled up to the, the, uh, the knee and then just with the little garter to keep it in place. And the garter he's wearing is a simple leather strap with one of the wickle bounder hooks attached to it. There's some dispute as to whether or not the wickle bounder hooks were actually attached to the wickle bonders or whether they were uh, affixed over top of that. Certainly this is a, a kinder solution in terms of the damage that putting hooks into the woven wool wickle bonder will do. So um, he doesn't actually have hooks on any of his wickle bonder. It also allows you to have one set of hooks and many different pairs of wickle bonder, which he has. He has a rainbow array of colors, um, depending on what sort of fancy mood he's in. So the, the garter allows you to then have your gorgeous wickle bonder hooks um, universal. You don't need to have eight or 10 pairs of those. So the calf, uh, the, the calf part is just a straight rectangle, basically? Um, basically, it's a little wider um, at the top, usually um, just because, uh, I mean, I want it to be able to fit over the calf, but I don't necessarily um, want it to be too, too tight. Um, so I make sure that it's going to fit over the fullness of his calf. Uh, if you make these for people who wear these after they participate in, in any combat sports, make sure that you measure their calf at its absolute fullest because uh, I have a pair that he has trouble putting on after he's been fighting because his calf gets all. So, um, so uh, it is basically a rectangular tube. I think I noted on the pattern that I, I, it just is slightly wider at the top. I think what's critical is making a tube that fits the leg of the person you're sewing for. I sew a pair for, uh, I sew these for our friend Eric as well, and he has a, a little bit more of a, a narrow calf, and his are basically a tube, so, and that works really nicely. But you need to make sure if you want to have the option of wearing it rolled up, is that it is not going to be cutting off the circulation at the, the calf or knee um, if it's too narrow. If you're going to use the hooks anyways, it doesn't matter if it is necessarily tight. It's actually probably better than it's not too snug. Okay, so, and what else do I have here? Um, I have my uh, email address that you can contact me at if you have any questions. 
And then I've also included a whole list of resources and I'll be making these slides available to you after the class through our lovely hostess. Um, but these are the resources that I would point you to if you want to do more digging into it. Um, and certainly some of the sources that I've cited. Um, like I said, this was designed to be a discussion about how to make pants that were consistent with the high taboo design uh, that were also very practical and, and wearable. Um, we have so much, uh, so little actual evidence. So this is a really a, a creative extrapolation based on, on the extant garments and the find. So I'm going to go back to um, actually get rid of the slides here. There we go. Perfect. So uh, let me show you then what the tube looks like on his yellow pants when it's down. It is just a great big rectangle slightly wider at the cuff. And you can see he wears his rolled up a bunch. So, and the, the trick with the legs, so this is another construction tip, trip, I, I trick rather. I know waistbands are probably not that tricky for people, but when it comes to the leg, one of the interesting things that you're going to have is you have a lot of volume pleated into that little tube. That's where the half and half and half honestly will be your bigger friend. The waistband is not as tricky. Um, but the, 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 the caps are tricky because they're this really tiny space. You're doing a lot of pleating volume into a little tiny space. So what I recommend that you do is, when you're making them, is you pleat them and when you join the cuff to the pants, actually do it inside out so that you can conceal the raw edges into the tube. So then you will sew that onto the, the pleats and then sort of wrap that edge around and sort of, and then whip that edge. So hopefully that makes sense. That's the, honestly, the part that always makes, where I get a little angry after being stabbed so many times by the needles is when, or the pins is when I'm pleating into this volume because you're fitting, an, you're fitting three meters into a little tiny tube. This is, these ones are hard, so. Um, or not quite, close to three, so. So that is where the tube and the leg joins. Okay, any questions about that? I definitely recommend making the tube longer than you think you'll need it to be because um, if it's pulled up by the, the, uh, the, the garter at the calf and then down the leg that pulls up some of the volume, you don't want it to run short, especially if they're wearing with the, with the uh, leg wraps over top, having it a little longer is, is really lovely um, and I'm, I'm told much more comfortable. So I'll err on length when it comes to that tube if you decide to do that. Um, the lower pleating is enclosed to prevent it from fraying. If you're using linen, you leave that raw edge open, uh, it can start to come unraveled. If you're using wool, you don't need to worry about that as much, especially if it's going to fall a little, fill, pull a little bit, pardon me. Uh, but it, with the linen, if, I find if you don't do something to that, uh, if you don't encase that, you could also go back and just add a separate strip of linen to that. Uh, but if you don't do something about that, because that is kind of a high tension point, that's the knee where a lot of that volume is coming into that narrow tube. If you don't do something to protect those raw edges of the linen, after a few washes, it's going to start to sort of destabilize. And uh, you don't want to have to try and fix the pleating again. Um, I can confidently tell you that. The nice thing is that aside from occasionally the, uh, the crotch sort of um, uh, seamed down, uh, sometimes he splits that join, he's never blown out the knees or the actual crotch of these pants, which is saying something. Um, somebody said, is that sort of like a French seam? And exactly, that, that would be precisely the, the construction that I would recommend. And I actually often will do these in a French seam technique, especially if I'm using really, really lightweight linen, or I've also had some wool that I've been asked to make into pants that frayed like mad. And so doing the French seams was a really, really efficient way of, of getting it nice and tidy. Uh, in closing the pleating, ah, so we've got a, somebody's asking me how to, how to do that. So um, I'm going to show you on the fabric. Let's see if I can pull this off for you. That's a little trickier. So if we have this edge, I'm going to do some big fat pleats. If this is our pleated edge, okay, and if this was our tube, we're going to lay the tube like this on the outside. So this is the outside of the pants and this is the inside of the tube and you're gonna sew it to the edge and then you're going to tape it, take it and turn it. And then that way you've, in, you've completely uh, covered that raw edge. 
Does that make sense? You can also, if that's too fussy, um, the first pair I ever did, I didn't worry about that. And all I did is just take a narrow strip of scrap linen and just attach a band over top of it to seal in the raw edges. Really, it doesn't matter how you do it. Again, this is one of our very, very much uh, a modern solution or an extrapolation of the pattern. I don't know how they did it. Um, and so, uh, you know, whatever is going to allow you to enclose those raw edges. Um, do you stitch in the ditch? I love stitching the ditch for this. Absolutely. I don't know if you can really see, but I've, I've also tacked it from behind on these pair, but I usually do the stitch in the ditch so it's nice and tidy and hidden. Um, really, like I said, whatever you can do that allows you to, to uh, gather up those raw edges so that it's not going to go coming unfrayed on you. It also makes that, that seam really strong. And of all the seams that are likely to break, that would be uh, you know, that would definitely be a spot that's under more strengths. It's the knee. If you could hide it on the outside, could it be contrasting? Absolutely. Um, the, the interesting thing about some of the pants fragments that they found um, from High Tabu is there is one pair that is um, contrasting, they, they believe based on the, the dye remnants that it was red and green. And so that, uh, and I can't remember now if it was this pair of high, the high tabu or another, but uh, there's more, there's quite a number of pants that they found there. And one of the pairs actually has where the crotch and the, and the seat is one color, and I believe it's green. And then the legs of the pants are, are red, which I think would be completely amazing. Yeah. So I think it would be, yeah, red and red in the front and green in the back. So yeah, so basically the, 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 the butt would be green and then the rest would be red. It would be really quite snazzy. And I think, you know, there's certainly evidence of the, that sort of um, using different colored fabrics in the same garment from, from this age. So uh, somebody said, I don't know if this is the fabric I have or if it was decorative. You know, in the end, um, if you, sometimes things are two things, right? It's the fabric I had and it looked cool. That's also viable. I try to remember that their decisions very often are not much different than ours. It's what I have in my stash. So we have all what I have in my fabric stash, what's going to look best, right? So I, I, and I think, you know, very often you can see where they're using different fabrics, but to the same color, obviously for effect. And then others like this, where they're clearly using different colors and it could be intentional and it could have been out of necessity. It's tough to say. Given the volume that these pants are supposed to have though, I have difficulty imagining that it wasn't decorative because it wouldn't take that much fabric out of the volume of the pants to just to have a bit, a bit for the seat and the, and the crotch. So it does feel to me based on the, the sort of presumed volume of these pants that it was a choice as opposed to a necessity. Unless it was a repair. I mean, maybe somehow they blew out the backside of the pants and this is what they had left, I, tough to say. Okay, so um, I think that covers all of the uh, really critical components that I wanted to mention. Um, like I said, uh, you, know, you can make them the drawstring if you're more comfortable with that. You can do the butted seam where it continues from the crotch to join the legs right up to the waistband and just make them a little larger and then have them uh, tie in. You could easily make them the same way but use loops like the Thorsberg. We know that they use loops on pants. Um, uh, prior to the Viking age. Um, you know, it, it's not a big extension to do that by any stretch. Uh, and then certainly, like I said, you can do the overlapped version. Um, I find, like I said, it, it's uh, from, from a very practical standpoint, if you don't have it tethered in some way, then it falls down. What my husband used to do is wear two belts. So he would have a belt that was for his pants, and then he would have a decorative belt over top. This style eliminates the need of having multiple belts, especially having a belt that's hidden. Most of his belts are pretty blingy and fabulous and having them underneath all of his clothes, it makes it a little lumpier, but also it hides some of his um, obvious wealth. And I think most of the, the um, evidence points to uh, embellishment and, and decorative elements being conspicuous. Um, there are not a lot of instances that we can see where they were doing hidden uh, luxury, you know, more sort of Tudor style where your where your bodies might be embroidered or something like that. Um, and so in this case, I, to me, having the layers that are splendid show really makes sense. And so, like I said, having another belt to just hold up his pants, a little bit extra sort of um, removes the visible opportunities for for the really splendid pants. Okay, does anyone have any other questions? We're coming up on almost 4.30 and I was hoping to not take more than an hour and a half on this. Uh, for your sake, not mine, I'm glad to answer questions. Uh, so if there are any other questions, uh, please let me know. Uh, striped fabric, what about striped fabric? 
someone asked. So and what good, weight of linen do you like to use? <laughs> what, what weight of linen do you like to use? So I use the standard, I bought my linen from uh, fabricstore.com and I use their standard uh, 019, which I think is eight ounce. Oh, I should know that. I'm so sorry. Five point, I think it's 5.3. 5.3. Thank you. 5.3 ounce. I use that for almost everything because it's pretty, uh, pretty lightweight, comfortable for summer, but it's pretty bulletproof as well. Anything lighter than that tends to have a, a high, high degree of wear. Um, and so I would use the, the 5.3. Thank you, Deza. Um, and uh, sorry, what was the second question? Striped fabric. Hmm. So striped fabric is really a cool question. We know that there was striped woven fabric. Um, there are a couple of garments that are more Eastern that definitely reflect that. Uh, certainly the Skolden Hum uh, garments, there's some striped uh, fabric that is part of the front placket of the, the, the uh, um, tunic or coat there. Uh, so it's certainly possible. Um, you know, the the very sort of old school Viking Asterix and Obelisk giant stripy pants, uh, I, that's pretty debatable. Um, but I, you know, a lot of the weaves that we have either could be conspicuous stripes, which would be two different colors, or you could also have that striped appearance through the weave. And, and you know, that can be really quite gorgeous. I think you're more likely to see the stripes run um, top to bottom rather than side to side, uh, just from the standpoint of uh, pleating against that, the, the pleats. I mean, I think that would look pretty Oh, who knows? It might be really amazing. Um, <laughs> but but I would think based on the the bits that we do have uh, striped, uh, this Golden Hama does, I'm trying to remember now if it runs vertical or, but it was just a small placket. Uh, but any of the others that that uh, exhibit patterns, you know, I I think that there, you would be more likely to see them running uh, uh, vertical as opposed to horizontal. I think um, it was splendid. Somebody asked about the weight of wool as well. I've done them in everything from very, very light summer weight suiting to um, very heavy, like not Melton, obviously, but really heavy, uh, dense wool. Um, and so the, uh, you know, you can do it in any. What I do find though is you're going to want to reduce some of the the volume you choose to put into the wool. It doesn't need as much pleating. I mean, part of what's happening here is you've got so much linen pleated into these these pants that they stand out with that lovely that lovely round fullness. With the wool, it has a lot more body, and so you don't necessarily need as much fullness to get that look. Um, it would depend on the weight of the wool you would use. It can also be quite hot. I mean. It, you, you can end up with three, three meters or three yards of, of wool around your waist. That's not, that's not nothing. Um, that said, if you want really snazzy, toasty pants, um, you know, my husband has a pair that are just about stand up by themselves and they're his when it's really, really cold out of Australia pants. So uh, they work out really, really well. Um, if you were using the, somebody commented that if you use the pleats or the pattern stripes vertically, it would help with the pleating. Absolutely. Really brilliant. Uh, somebody asked if uh, these could be used for Russian or Varangian garb. So th this is really tricky because we don't, we have so little to go by, but certainly we see in some of the Eastern uh, clothing of very similar voluminous pants. Uh, given the, the location, I mean, Haithabu was a, a big trade center. Um, the images that we see are all over, but definitely, you know, we see them in Gotland, which was, you know, was a, a, was a major trade point. Um, you know, so I think it, it is plausible. Um, you know, there's some argument that pants are pants are pants, right? Um, you know, there's only so many ways to wrap fabric around your, your bottom side. So, uh, but given the, the um, distribution of images that we've, we've found, uh, I think, and given the, the areas where we certainly have found uh, extant pants that are within that sort of scope, I think that, you know, it, it's not improbable to see them in, in the Eastern, but don't take that as a, I said they're totally authentic because they're not. So. <laughs> um, but I think it would be viable. Uh, the other question was about colors. Colors, we don't know. Um, I would say look to what fabric colors were likely found within um, the uh, the area that you are uh, recreating or that you're interested in. You know, there's lots of, of information out there about what are period appropriate dye, dye choices, and I would definitely look at that. Um, there's lots of arguments about the poofy pants. A lot of people get really uh, feel very strongly about it. And I get that we don't have a lot of actual physical evidence, but there are so many images that show men in giant poofy pants uh, that clearly end before the ankle. I have difficulty imagining that they're just drawing fabulous pants and, and that nobody was wearing fabulous pants. 
So, uh, because there are, like, I could have probably pulled up 20 rune stones that show them. So this is not an isolated instance where we're trying to uh, justify fabulous pants based on a, on a you know a quote from Ibn and a, and a single a single uh, you know drawing or what have you. That I could easily have pulled up twenty. So I I, I think um, I think how they were necessarily designed uh, then you know that is certainly and the pattern that I use like I said that's me in interpreting an existing pattern that that made sense to me I don't pretend to say that this is the way that they definitively were made I mean until we find somebody actually wearing them as opposed to the remnants found from uh, caulking in a boat I think it's pretty problematic uh, but I think you know the silhouette works it's within the scope of extant patterns that, and, and designs uh, for garments that we have. I feel like they are a reasonable interpretation, which given what we have in terms of, of fabric finds, I think that's the best we can actually aim for when it comes to, to uh, Viking Age clothing in particular. Any other questions? Uh, some people are saying some very nice things. Thank you. Um, so if there are any other aren't any other questions, what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap up now. Uh, I will be sending the presentation, the PowerPoint presentation to Mr. Stiza shortly so that you can access that as well. Uh, you should have access to the other documents that I'd sent her. Uh, if you have any questions, I would included my email address on the PowerPoint and I don't do that lightly. If you have questions, I will answer you absolutely more than glad to. I've also left my name on the screen as my mundane name because that's my name on Facebook. So if you want to try and find me uh, on Facebook, that would be the name that you would find me by. I don't use Inga on, uh, on Facebook. So I've left my name up there by intention. Excellent. So uh, if you have any other questions, then please reach out to me. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining me today. And I hope that uh, my husband's fabulous pants make sense to you now. So thank you so much and have a lovely day, everyone.